Sidewalk Labs is this amazing opportunity to bring a bunch of technologists together with a bunch of urbanists to take advantage of the amazing things that technology has to offer with a deep understanding about like what really makes cities tick. Instead of saying a problem is just about technology or it's just about policy, in most cases the answer is it's both. We find the very best people in the world who can go and think about solving those types of problems. Bottom line, Sidewalk Labs wants to make the quality of life in cities better. Hello everybody, welcome to Sidewalk Labs. Welcome to Hudson Yards. I hope you're already enjoying the view. Uh, we are very glad that all of you could be here tonight. Uh, this is our first live event, first of what we hope uh, is many live events. And, uh, and so we're, we're trying to build a community of folks like yourselves who are very invested in the future of cities. The quickest way we could think to do that was to offer free beer. It's clearly worked. Thank you very much. Go to town. Uh, one of our core missions at Sidewalk Labs is to bridge the divide between two groups we call technologists and urbanists. Technologists being the engineers, uh, the software developers, the entrepreneurs. Uh, here's Hod Lipson, he's one of them. Um, coming up with the new advances for cities. And of course the urbanists, the people who work in cities, who live in cities, who plan cities, who love cities. And, and we really feel that these two groups don't always speak the same language and if you can get them to speak the same language, that's essential to addressing the big urban challenges that we face today. Things like mobility, things like housing, things like government services. Uh, if you can get those two groups working together and collaborating, you can have them implement ideas uh, that actually improve people's lives, which is the goal at the end of the day. Uh, so you will see on your badges, when you registered, you self-identified as urbanist or technologist. Uh, your badges should reflect that choice. I encourage you during the course of the night to go out and ch chat up another color badge. Uh, <laughs> make a friend, make a memory. Um, and so we can, we can grow that community. The topic that we're here to discuss tonight is what is the city's role when it comes to autonomous vehicles, AVs? So that means self-driving cars, that means autonomous transit or taxis. Maybe that means drone delivery. But what is the city's role when it comes to planning and preparing for this future? Now, that question has become more and more common as it's become more and more clear that this future is a reality. We saw in September the US Department of Transportation uh, acknowledge that the technology was right around the corner when it released its autonomous vehicles policy guidelines and we are very fortunate to have Dee Williams from DOT here today, who's going to tell us a little bit about that and talk to us about those guidelines. And that really was a landmark first step and a very important first step. But what those guidelines didn't do, and it was intentional, was say much about the role for cities, other than to explain that self-driving cars should have to follow local traffic laws like turning right on red. Well, everybody here recognizes that there are bigger implications to autonomous vehicles than their ability to turn right on red. I mean, we're talking at the, at the big level for metro areas, but also for the smaller level of the urban core. The first thing, of course, that comes to mind is safety. When you're talking about the highways that connect our cities, that run through our cities. If you can eliminate distracted driving, if you can eliminate drowsy driving, drunk driving, you can save thousands and thousands of lives every year. So that's great. But in the, at the very local level, in the, in the dense urban environments, the implications are also enormous and really exciting. Uh, speaking as a transportation nerd, extremely exciting to think about what we might be able to do with parking in particular. Um, because if you have shared autonomous vehicles and you no longer need as many parking garages, as many surface lots, as many curbside spaces, you can begin to reimagine what you want to do with that space. You can put bus lanes and bike lanes in. You could put pop-up parks in. You could build more housing in those areas. You could give that space back to people. Uh, pedestrian interactions is another implication, and it's unclear kind of which way that will go. 
my colleague, Rid Agarwal, I can't find him here, but he's here somewhere. He likes to point out that, that one of the, the things that can save your life as a pedestrian is making eye contact with a driver when you're in a crosswalk. Well, what happens when the other person doesn't have any eyes and isn't a person? I don't know how pedestrians are going to react and behave when they start interacting in a driverless world. And then, of course, we have to think about jobs. If driverless vehicles become taxis, if they become transit buses, if they become uh, trucks, what does that mean for local workers? What does it mean for the local economy? Now, technologists and urbanists, they, they often think, I mean, they, they, they share these the knowledge of these implications, but they often set different priorities around them. In the process of uh, coming up with this event, I spoke with a number of experts across the urban technology spectrum. And I don't want to paint with too broad a brush because there is a good degree of overlap. But a lot of technologists will tell you that it's too early for cities to really focus on self-driving cars. That's because at the moment, they think the focus needs to be on getting the cars as much testing as possible in complex urban environments so they can deliver on those safety promises and benefits we all hope they can. Let me quote to you uh, from my conversation with Brad Sturtz at Audi. So I use the original iPad here. If cities start overreacting, there's a possibility they could limit what you can do to test AVs. That is the number one concern as the technology continues to evolve. We need to get the miles, the experience, the different scenarios tested so machine learning can unfold. Now, urbanists look at this a little differently. I mean, that's not going to surprise you. But uh, urbanists, uh, they see a more active role for cities right now in terms of planning and preparing for this future. I mean, they look back on a century of, what, of cars in cities and what the car has done to cities. And they know that as driving has increased, as it really might with a driverless world, things like local traffic's gotten worse, pedestrian safety's gotten worse, air quality, sprawl, uh, even transit equity to a large degree has all gotten worse. And so I'll quote now from the urbanist historian Peter Norton, who wrote the great book Fighting Traffic. There's a naive view that AVs are themselves beneficial. They can be beneficial only if we deliberately make them so. There is a future in which AVs are one of many tools in service of a more sustainable city where people have real mobility choices. Now, regardless of where you fall on this spectrum, the fact is that cities are starting to have this conversation, and that's a great thing. I mean, we saw last month, New York City Council got a lot of tech leaders in the same room, started to talk about the implications of autonomous vehicles. Boston has announced an initiative to do something similar. At Sidewalk, we've partnered with Transportation for America, started a collaborative of 16 cities from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C., to discuss these very issues, trade ideas about pilots, trade ideas about implementing autonomous technology, and other forms of new mobility. Because at the end of the day, what it's really about is making cities better. I mean, it's, it's not enough for this technology to just arrive into cities. It actually has to improve urban life for us all to succeed. Uh, I think we share that goal. The question is how we get there. And we believe, again, that uh, part of the answer is convening urbanists and technologists in rooms like this one, in sessions like this one, uh, to have these kinds of discussions. Uh, so with that, I'm going to uh, outline the program for you really quick and then introduce uh, our panel and we can get started. Uh, so we will first have this, this panel chat for about uh, 30 or 40 minutes, I can't remember. Um, and we'll talk about some of the issues I raised and some of the challenges facing cities. Uh, and then after that, we're going to have a second brainstorm. It's going to occur in breakout groups um, that you were handed a card when you came in that I hope you haven't lost yet. Uh, that will show you where to, where to go, and don't worry, I'll remind you uh, afterwards. So you guys can talk about some of the issues we raised here. Then we will recap the brainstorms and let you get to the real reason you came tonight, which is obviously the free beer. So with that, let me introduce our speakers. I'll sit down. As I mentioned, all the way on the right uh, is Dee Williams. She is uh, the team leader of the Federal Automated Vehicles Policy Implementation Team. Those are the guidelines I talked about uh, at USDOT and at the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA. Uh, thank you, Dee, for joining us. We have Hod Lipson uh, to her left, um, the roboticist at Columbia University, the mechanical engineer. 
Uh, he's written an excellent book, um, Driverless. What's the full title? Intelligent Cars and the Road Ahead. It just came out. I highly recommend it. Uh, thank you, Han. We have Christine Bertet, uh, who is um, the co-chair of the Transportation Planning Commission uh, Committee at uh, Manhattan Community Board 4, which is where Hudson Yards is. So, so this is her turf. Um, she's also the co-founder of CheckPeds, a pedestrian safety organization uh, in New York City. Hello, Christine. And we have Andrew Salzberg, the head of policy and research uh, at a company, I don't know if I pronounced this right, Uber? Sure. Uber. <laughs> Um, welcome. Dee, I, I told you before I wanted to start with you because we, we mentioned the, the, the federal guidelines and, and I think what we want to know in this room is first of all, you know, what, what type of involvement did cities have in those guidelines, if any, they might not have. And, and then beyond that, I mean, what is the role that you see uh, for cities? It, what is a useful role, I guess, is another way to ask it. Sure. So first, actually, I'd like to start out, if you don't mind. Sure. I do want to just let, um, communicate some of the stats, go a little bit deeper of why we were so forward-leaning and continue to be forward-leaning with implementing that policy document, which was released on September 20th. And the reason being is because we are facing a public health crisis. The Department of Tra Transportation looks at roadway fatalities and the increase that we've had this last year, which is up 8%. We lost 35,092 lives. That's, of course, all of our, our mothers, sisters, brothers, fathers. You know, most people, if, if, if I ask you, ra raise a hand if you've lost someone due to a roadway crash. Can you do that for me? I know I have at a very young age, and it's affected me still to today. So that, that's the one number I want you guys to take away from here. The second one, and if you heard our administrator speak, Administrator Rosekind, he, um, he gives out the number 94%. And that's why automated vehicle technology is so important. And that's because that 94% of fatalities, it's due to human choice or error. And, and Eric hit on this a little bit. The reasons being is distraction, it's still drunk driving, it's um, speeding, it's also folks not wearing their seatbelts, which we all know is your best defense if you are involved in a motor vehicle crash. So I just wanted to start with that and, and give a, you know, some images, put them in your head. I mean, it really it equates to a 747 going down once a week. And with the increase of 8%, it's five more jumbo jets in a year. So I mean, I think that should put it all in perspective for you. And then with the policy development piece, that actually went, it did go a long way. It included, and it's still going on. We are meeting, we had one last week on Thursday. We're holding several public meetings, and that's been going on throughout the development of that policy, and now, you know, with the open comment period for it, and some of the things that we're trying to implement in there. So there definitely is a role, um, and there has been conversations with states and localities, and we continue, we urge folks, if they do have suggestions or comments, that comment period does not close until November 22nd. So, so all input will be considered. And um, the last part of your question, I, I apologize. <laughs> no, it's OK. So I mean, what, what do you see that the, As what, the role? What role could the city yeah. play? Yeah. Sorry about that. That's OK. Um, so yeah, really where we see the role, and we tried to, in the section two of the policy, it's called model state policy. That's actually where states come in, and, but also localities. We tried to lay out and differentiate the roles between what we do, of course, in the federal government, that being NHTSA and otherwise, and then what, what we see as the roles of the states and localities. And there are, there are areas that we would urge you to be looking at and considering, um, and that can go from, well, the, the uh, obvious one is, of course, your traffic regulations and, and laws. And um, we were talking a little bit earlier just back in the room, and, and one in particular, like for instance for New York, is you guys still have a law on the books that does require your hand to be on the steering wheel. Well, a lot of these auto manufacturers, someday they're going to where they don't want, and you know, there may not be a steering wheel. Right now it has to have the steering wheel because that's part of our, our uh, the motor vehicle safety standards, but that could change. Um, so those are the kind of things we would encourage cities to be looking at of you know licensing um, end states, but licensing your inspections, 
uh, that kind of stuff, your traffic regulations, uh, insurance and, and, and liability. So that's really where what we see. And just smart, smart uh, roadway design. So going forward, you know, what could change? Is it pavement markings? Maybe it's even fiber op optic uh, cable and, and that advancement where that's going. Things that are gonna be needed for this technology to advance and what, what can cities and localities do in that area. And I think others are gonna hit on it, but um, beyond infrastructure, there's other things as well. And, and that's, you know, taking a look at public transportation and where do you see that headed? and ride sharing services and what does that look like and what changes need to be made to not only foster the, the AV technology, but, but some of those, those things that are coming about because of, of this technology. We'll definitely, we'll definitely get to some of that. Yep. Hod, let me ask you, because you've written that when it comes to autonomous vehicles, the technology is far ahead of the regulation. Now, I, I know you wrote this a little while ago, but where do you see that standing now, and how does the regulation catch up, and especially at the, at the city level, what do they need to be thinking about? Well, first, uh, um, things have changed. Regulation has also moved forward. But I want to echo what you said about uh, safety also. My stat that, that blew my mind uh, when we were writing, uh, Melba Kerman and I were writing the book, was that uh, uh, if you look worldwide, not just in the US, it's, it's uh, 23,000 people dead a week. I mean, that doesn't blow your mind. That's a nuclear, Hiroshima-scale nuclear bomb going every month, uh, silently, killing innocent people. That, that's a number that makes me feel that this is an urgent uh, thing we have to do, and, and uh, the world is looking to the U.S. to do this first. And uh, so it's urgent that we do this. Every week we have silly debates about ethics of how, you know, what to do in this in a peculiar situation. Another 30, 23,000 people will die. So this is how urgent it is, uh, and uh, the sooner we get on with it, the better. I think that the... the uh, the benchmark sort of is, is it better than a human driver or not? And, and the, all the regulation tries to get to that number. Right? How do we assess and uh, whether it's a good driver or not? And that's, that's, uh, that's where sort of we need to be, and that's sort of the, the criteria. So, um, and I forgot what you were asking. <laughs> also, we all have our... Opening you, statements. You, you, still see yeah. the, you still see the tech is ahead of the, yeah, the so, regulation. So I think I think you know. So what's driving driverless car? The technology has been uh, up until now. There's there's lots of technological elements, but most of them were already in place. There was this just this last piece of technology that didn't mature, and that's the ability of cars to perceive their local environment. So for for decades, we could find the shortest path from A to B. We could. Uh, we could have a computer controlling the engine. That wasn't the problem. The problem is, can a, can a car tell the difference between a pothole and a shadow, between a fire hydrant and a toddler? Can it merge into traffic? These sort of subtle things. That technology has made progress in the last, I'd say, two years, uh, way ahead of what it, it, was, it did in, in, 10, in 20 years beforehand. And it's all machine learning. So machine learning accelerates. The more data it has, the better it gets. The better it gets, the more it drives, the better it gets, it learns from other cars. So these things accelerate. So the gap and the speed at which this, at which this technology accelerates uh, is accelerating. All right, so that's the nature of, of exponential curve. So, uh, so I think it's, again, it's urgent that we do it. And we, we, I, I do think that we are sort of now missing the, uh, the policy guidelines. And I'm, I'm very happy, I was happy to see uh, this come out. To, companies are saying we have the technology, some, some claim it's ready, some claim it's almost ready. How good is good enough? That's what everybody's asking. It's not a question of does it work or not. How good does it need to work? It's never going to be perfect. I think it needs to be as good as the average human driver, maybe twice as good if you're conservative, but that's it. So, so I think, uh, I think the, to answer your question, it's technology is even more ready than it was when we discussed it uh, a few months ago, uh, and uh, it's going to be, it's only moving forward. Christine, I mean, so we talked, uh, we've talked about the federal level here and, and just kind of peeked a bit at what cities might, might start to do, but I mean, you, you are one of the, one of the great uh, the reasons that it's, it's great to have you on this panel is you, you represent a neighborhood of a city. I mean, we, so often we think about autonomous vehicles as a systematic problem. 
uh, across the city. But but here, you know, you represent Manhattan Community Board for this is this is a neighborhood problem. When you look at this problem uh, from that perspective of what a city might be able to do, and you look at what might get your constituents and the people, your neighbors, uh, asking for change, what what would that take, and 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 what do you think? the city's response should be? So first, I think that uh, my neighbors would be delighted to have um, anything else than drivers. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, if you could see that queue of cars going to New Jersey with no drivers, would be like in heaven. But the second thing is that I think it is perfectly um, appropriate. Your comment is like for, uh, you know, in Hill's Kitchen, we have our crazies, right? And uh, some of us love to go around cars and bang on the, on, on the hood and really get upset at drivers. And there are not going to be any drivers to get mad at. And so, you know, the person next to it is going to say, hey, it's not me, it's the other guy, right? And so I don't know what we're going to do. It's going to be very, dis <laughs> very disconcerting for uh, the Yorker locals. New Yorkers might have to become nice. Is that what right, right, right. That's going to be very bizarre. But uh, beside that, um, the things that we are most concerned, I would say, there are about three things. One is how, safety. How is I going to detect pedestrians? You know, the, the well-known issue of cars turning into, and they have a green light, and the pedestrian have a walk sign, and is the car going to respect the walk sign or the green light, and what's the rule there? Because code is written by people, and people have biases. And I should so, say, Christine has a background at, at IBM, <laughs> right. so she's not just making this up. So anyway, uh, so you know, who is going to check how is the code written and whether it's like, OK, I respect the green light or I respect the walk sign? So I want to make sure about that. That's a concern, a real concern. Uh, the second thing is a little less of a concern, but a, a challenge, I think, how cars are going to respect the gridlock laws. You know, I'm not supposed to get in the intersection until the intersection on the other side is clear. Well, that's a complicated decision, right? Is, uh, you know, is the light over there becoming red or green, and can I move or not? And so I'm really interested into the, res the code resolution on that. That's a fascinating thing. Yeah. No, no, people are horrible. I'm, I'm just interested. I mean, you know, that's, that's only going to be better, but, you know, then it's going to be frustrating because, you know, the competition with other people, right? So it brings the issue of are we going to have local, localized software, like, you know, the aggressive New York version, and then the, uh, you know, the retired. Florida version where everybody, and then the Midwest version where everybody's like, you can go, you can go, you can go, and everything is cool, right? But maybe we need two or three localized version of the software because it's the context, the context is important, right? Uh, and then the final thing which uh, I will put to my friend of Uber there is that I can see, you know, we all take taxis and we all text Uber, so you know, you hail a Uber, you are in a Uber, and you say, I want to stop here. And there is no parking spot, and there is no standing, and there is no curb space. So is the code going to say, well, it's illegal, let me keep going. And you're going to be in the car, going around the block, and never getting off the Uber car, right? I can see that as a real concern. What is the code? And how is the code going to be smart about those things? And is the code going to have to be coded to be illegal? <coughs> Oh, okay, maybe, I don't know. But, but this is, this is well, and, and that's where we get to the sidewalk management and the curb management, because you know, if you don't have a space at the sidewalk, how do you stop? And we all make those decisions of, right. you know, let me stop a little further, it doesn't bother this guy, I'm just so, so those subtle decisions, but that's very important, obviously, the, the, that, that aspect. Uh, and, and it poses some uh, important questions. So, so we definitely want to get back to the curb. I know that was pre pretty much all we talked about back there for 20 minutes. Right. But, but Andrew, first I want to ask you, um, I mean, everybody is familiar with, with Uber's pilot in, in Pittsburgh and what they're doing. Uh, when, to, from what you can tell us, I mean, what was the city's objective with that pilot and, and how did that objective, you know, how did Uber, you know, discuss that objective and, the, and they reach kind of a balance of what they both wanted to achieve from that pilot. Yeah, so I think if you talk to 
Mayor Perduto in Pittsburgh, who's been a big supporter. I mean, he's got a whole strategy around economic development that long predates Uber coming there or self-driving cars being on the road, right? It's about being a hub for innovation. It's about building kind of a new Pittsburgh with, with jobs centered on robotics and automation. So there's a long line of things they've been doing in that, and I think this is just the most recent one, maybe one of the more high-profile pieces. Um, but I think that's, that's a lot of what their motivation is. I think what's interesting from my perspective, you, know, you had the quote from Audi testing vehicles, right? There are many, many companies out there who are designing autonomous cars, whether they're OEMs or um, other tech companies. I think what's interesting for, for Uber to be doing it, and obviously I'm biased, um, but I think what's nice is that there's, you know, there's been two technologies that have happened recently, but in, in a certain order. And one of them is the ability to get a ride on your phone and ultimately to share a ride with a stranger. And that's been going for, depending how you count, four, five, six years. And then in parallel, there's a development of autonomous cars. And I think people in this room, probably a lot of you have read you know, Robin Chase's pieces about the two directions this might go, right? There's the direction that, for those of you who saw the Tesla video, where it kind of sits in your garage and drives around the suburbs and everyone owns their own and they're painted different colors and you get to put your bumper sticker on them and you personalize yours and it, it's yours. Or there's a model where they're shared. I think there's very different consequences and we can talk a lot about you know, how cities play a role there. But I think what's interesting for us is that you know, we have been sharing rides, interacting with cities, interacting with transit agencies, you know, running a service um, across the world, not just in context in the US, and now autonomy is coming. And so to me, that's encouraging in a way that we are not just testing whether the car can drive itself, but whether it can pick someone up successfully or whether it can make the rider feel comfortable in the backseat. Yeah. You know, it's sort of layering on autonomy onto a shared on-demand network as opposed to autonomy as part of a car manufacturing process, which I think is, is different in some important ways, hopefully. Right. I mean, so, so what that actually brings up to me is, is this, you're saying Mayor Peduto, you know, he, he wants to kind of uh, promote economic development and, and certainly innovation. But then the question becomes, how do you balance that desire, the desire for innovation with the, you know, the natural um, civil servant desire of protecting residents and protecting, you know, making sure that uh, the testing that happens, that occurs, can be done in the most responsible way possible. Uh, so how do, you, how do you begin to think about drawing that balance? It's probably gonna look different for, for different cities. Um, and, and you know, it's, it's probably ideological to some extent too, but. And maybe folks in the panel were kind of better equipped to talk about safety than I am. But I think you know, from the beginning, obviously top priority is safety, right? Yeah. The cars are conservative, but in some ways is an issue where they're more conservative than the average uh, driver on the road potentially. But that, that certainly has been kind of job one, I think. But I'd love to hear more from, from these guys about how you actually ensure that happens as part of any testing process. Yeah, so some of that's happening, like I mentioned earlier, it's happening right now. With We have the uh, connected vehicles pilots going on. There's one in Wyoming and, and one right here in New York City, another in Tampa. But there was also the Smart Cities Challenge, and that's something that will continue um, where you know we are encouraging innovation and, and providing funding for, for states and, and uh, localities to pursue different options that, that they're looking at to solve some of their transportation issues. Safety for us, it will always remain number one. It is our top priority. And you know it, when incidents do occur, um, which we anticipate there will be, and, and even right now, you know there have been some, um, but we will use our, our, all of our authorities that, that we have to address those incidents as necessary. So again, safety will remain our top priority, but, but this testing does have to happen, and we need the data. Um, so that's, I mean, I don't know if anyone else wants to offer anything. So, so one idea that uh, we had, actually I was planning to, to email you, so I can tell you <laughs> now uh, directly, is that I think for consumers, it's very difficult to understand all the safety stuff and how does it actually play out and what the metrics and different companies claim throw out all kinds of numbers and it's very difficult to assess. So wouldn't it be wonderful if there was some kind of rating system? Uh, just, you walk onto a, onto a uh, you know, uh, you want to buy a car, let's say you see the, the horsepower, you see the mile per gallon, there would be another a third number on the wheel, windshield and that would be how, uh, how does this compare to the average human driver? Is this uh, 1.2 times more safe? Is it two times? Maybe you pay a little bit more and you get 10 times safer. Uh, I think I think that will help consumers. It will help also uh, companies to have a sort of a single metric that's understandable. Just like in the old days, people invented horsepower for that 
for that reason, so that people could compare engines to horses, and it made sense. We need something simple like that. And when people will understand, okay, this is 1.2 times safer than average driver, they, it will set expectations in a way that will help policymakers reach decisions, uh, will help people understand that it's not perfect, uh, it's not 100% safe, but, but it's, it's better than what we have now. And so that kind of simple metric is, not metric, I would say uh, uh, a rating system, because behind the scenes you have to have a very complex independent testing system that verifies these numbers. But for the consumer, we need, I think, a very simple uh, sort of way to assess how this is going. Uh, I wanted to ask, I told you earlier, I mean, drawing off my, my example of, of parking, and Christine, you brought up that Tesla video, and in that video, the, the owner of the car clearly sends their car to a, a parking spot somewhere far away. I mean, the, the, the flip side of that I see is what Uber is doing in Summit, New Jersey, which is, okay, you don't actually build this parking lot at all because Uber uh, is working with, with the train station and the transit provider to, to get people to the station so that they don't have to drive there in the first place. Um, Good question, I'll take that one. That sounds good. <laughs> I, 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 I'd be interested to see where you take that, but I guess that, you know, that, that gets back to the question of, of, that you raised of, yeah. of how we get to shared versus private ownership. Sure, yeah, and I think we talked about this before, but you know, all these, you know, the problems that cities are facing are not new. There's only so much road space in a place like Manhattan. How do you manage it effectively? You know, whether the car has a driver in it or it doesn't, some of the problems are the same. And so I think parking obviously is a good one as well, right? Parking is, sorry, apologies. I'll speak more into the mic. Um, parking is, is one of those, right? Parking's been around for a long time. And I think what was attractive about working with Summit was that if you think about parking, it's not a terribly efficient use of space, but on the spectrum of parking, probably the most inefficient one is commuter lot parking, where people literally drive in the morning, they park their car, it sits there for 10 hours or whatever, and they come back and pick it up at the end of the day. That has to be the, the least efficient use of parking. At least street parking in a place like Manhattan hopefully turns over several times during the day. So if we're gonna start talking about how you change parking, it's always nice to go for the most extreme example, and Summit was one of those. I think we had the data for a lot of the towns along the Jersey Transit line, they often limit the parking to people who live within the town, which means the average commute is like, a mile and a half or something, right? So there's not a long distance that people are coming to then sit their car there for 10 hours. So there's a lot of opportunity for us to work today um, with the service that we have on the ground to try and get away from some of those things, to change some of the ways that road space is used, that infrastructure is used, um, the transit systems interact with people. That can ultimately, obviously, you can layer in autonomous down the road. Maybe the more important thing now is getting people to give up their own car, to rely on some other service, to not tow a few tons of steel with them everywhere they go. And if we can set that pattern in places like Summit and elsewhere, then yes, eventually, if the car goes to fully autonomous, so much the better, but the pattern's already set now. message of not talking. <laughs> um, well, I think, I think parking is really, really critical and you can look at it multiple ways. Like in New York City, if you uh, arrive at a place and you don't have to park your car, there is a, uh, you know, and you can send your automated, autonomous car to go park somewhere else, you may have a risk that in, encourages you to drive more because parking is one of the obstacles to using a car today in New York City. I, I don't mean New York City, I mean Manhattan. Um, so there is that. But on the other hand, um, you know, having what you were describing, which is a parking lot with uh, 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 people being able to use a car to share a car to go to, to a train station, it would allow you to get people which live m further away from the train station to go to take the train. So you may have a catchment area which is much wider and that would be really uh, productive. Yeah, um, I mean, so you were, I mean, you were talking about the curb also. I'm, I'm curious, you, you deal a lot with, with the local DOT. What, what are the, the policy levers that you see that, that come into play when you're talking about things like finding space at the curb like you were just talking about or, or ultimately identifying parcels of parking that we might not need anymore. As you see it, how might that come into play in a place like where we are right now? Well, it, 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 it's not very hard. <laughs> you have to remove all the placard, 
from all the uh, uh, you know NYPD, and then you have to remove all the placard from all the uh, the you know the people leaving the administration, and you immediately free up about sixty or seventy thousand spaces. That doesn't sound hard at all. That's right. <laughs> it just has to be done. And then, uh, and then there is obviously the uh, you know pricing the, the 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 curb, and and getting to the point where the curb is really um, uh, turning over. So park smart. I mean, we already know that this is n nothing new, but we are not doing it right. And uh, so if, I think if you do two or three of those things, you get it. And finally, there is indeed the issue of congestion pricing because when you get to a neighborhood or like Manhattan where you have too many cars, period, you know, nothing is going to work as long as we have too many cars. There's no question that technology is not going to work when you have too many cars. We are over, over committed on the resources and we can't, we can't function uh, reasonably there. Just, just to pick up on that last point, right? I think there's, there's a couple places where there are good policy things that have been out there for a long time that are very hard politically, but that are also selfishly good for Uber, which is kind of a nice place to be. Um, like pricing parking is something we've been advocating for for a long time, but obviously if you price parking, then the alternative, we don't have to park, looks better. So I'm very happy to shout from the rooftop um, that pricing parking is a good thing. It's a good thing in its own right. It's also a good thing for us. I think congestion pricing in a place like Manhattan is in many ways similar. If you think that you, know, you are pricing the vehicle mile, we are a broker essentially of vehicle miles delivered to the rider in the most efficient way possible, then that's a competitive advantage for us. It's also good policy, I think, for a place like Manhattan. So there's a bunch of places like that where maybe the politics get easier for good policy to happen as shared mobility and potentially shared autonomous mobility right. become more widespread. If you're not driving, if you're not behind the wheel, your outlook on some of those policies might change and they might change today, right? We don't need necessarily to have autonomous to have pretty compelling on-demand options. So I think. There's a bunch of those solutions that have, they're not new, right? You can read, you know, I don't know how decades old books about pricing roads, but I think they might get easier in a world where people are consuming transportation as a service. Let me just ask the, the whole group. I mean, it, for, for cities to get actively involved, what, what would it take? I mean, do, is there some type of watershed event that you feel would, would actually motivate cities to, to start being more active when they're planning and preparing? for autonomous vehicles? I mean, because what you're just saying, Andrew, is again, a lot of this stuff is stuff we've talked about for a long time. It could be implemented if, if a city wanted to. At any point in time, it's just uh, maybe this technology creates the political momentum and the political will for that. Um, so I guess what, what is the, the moment that, that kind of uh, lets a DOT say, all right, now we need to come out with automated vehicle policy guidelines. It, what will be the equivalent moment for, for cities? Well, I, I, I think one, one trigger could be uh, pending investments in public transportation. And, and the, uh, we were just talking uh, on the radio in, uh, in Seattle, and one of the questions there was, okay, we are about to sign into law a, uh, I think it was a 20-year investment of $68 billion in public transportation. And... Uh, that the design of that system does not factor in driverless cars. So suddenly there's a, a when, you, when you look so far ahead and you make such huge investments, that's a point where you say, okay, uh, let's, let's stop for a moment and think where we want to invest this. Do we want to build another subway or do we want to take that huge amount of uh, capital and think about how we get ready for driverless cars. So these, this is a, that's a trigger. It's, it's a sort of a financial trigger, but at some point we have to make these big decisions and we have to make a choice. And I think that's, that's a good place to, to start. So the thing I would add is you're going to have to balance it because, you know, until the fleet is fully, we incorporate these technologies, it doesn't turn over. It's, it's going to take probably 25 to 30 years so it, it's considering those things now and starting to plan for them in, in the long-range planning. And w another document I, I would encourage folks if they haven't looked at it, because it does include lots of good policy options to start looking at, it's called Beyond Traffic. And that's something I would, I would encourage you to, to take a look, because it, it lays out several scenarios of uh, trends that are occurring, choices that the population is making, um, 
you know, we were, we were kidding around a little bit, but some of my younger siblings, they, you know, they chose not to get their driver's license until they were in their late 20s. So things are happening and, and you know, it's gonna push these forward, but it's gonna take, it's gonna take some time, especially for that fully autonomous, autonomous vehicle to potentially uh, be within the fleet fully. So I would just keep that in mind. Um, long range planning, so these things should be considered but there needs to be a balance because we're still losing, as I mentioned earlier, today, 35,092 people. The Han raised a point that I would, I would love to hear Andrew and, and Christine maybe speak to in terms of, I mean, ultimately that question of how we spend funding comes back down to the local level in terms of transit equity and, and how we make sure everybody has access to the same types of transportation options. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good question. I think it's interesting that you that you raise it. I think you know it's certainly true that how you do public transport will like. I'm speaking into it. All right, sorry. Thank you. I appreciate the guidance. That was good. Uh, will likely change, but I don't know. You know, it's not so clear to me. There are people who are. There are sometimes politicians who make off the cuff remarks like, "Oh, we don't need transit anymore. Self driving's coming," and I think that's super counterproductive. I think it's it's clear that things might change, but there's also a way in which having an available on demand option actually supports fixed rail transit, right? In New York, I take the subway in the morning because it's always much faster, but if I stay late in the office and I know I can grab an Uber, I happen to get them for free, which helps. Um, but, you know, I'll ride home with them. So that, that's useful. But I think there's a lot of ways, if you look at a place like LA that's not Manhattan, where maybe the transit during the peak hours is great, but off-peak it's pretty bad, if the combination of some on-demand mobility, autonomous mobility can help make you more willing to give up your car, make you rely on a mix of options, those things can work together. And there's a lot of ways that there's an upside for transit, as well as certainly places it's gonna change, uh, but there's a spectrum to that. So I think as people think through that, it's gonna be, it's complicated and it's hard, and it's something I think it's helpful for us to be working with places like Summit or the MBTA in Boston where we're thinking about paratransit, just to start like putting something to this as opposed to having it be an abstract conversation to actually sit down and say, well, can we deliver services more cheaply and more effectively or not and where and when and so i think you know what i we've had a suite of options to provide transportation for people um, in cities whether they're low income or elsewhere uh, otherwise and that that has been you know the handful of traditional transit options now potentially we have a new one whether it's shared mobility today or autonomous vehicles maybe there are places where that can give you access to jobs at a rate that was not possible before because you know the bus only came every couple hours or you had to transfer from bus to bus there's a lot of places where Transit service could certainly be improved for people who, who need it. Um, and a lot of places where the service is least effective, it's also most costly. You know, I think the opposite of that is a subway here where you know, a ride's fairly cheap, but it's also quite good relative to the options. There are places where that's the reverse. Um, so I think there's a lot of ways that you could seize on this and actually deliver services better to a lot of populations that haven't had them. Paratransit's an obvious example, but there are a lot of other ones out there. Yeah. Really, uh, uh, one of the observations in New York City is that the, the volume of um, uh, uh, transit users or would-be transit users or job seekers between like Brooklyn and Queens and Queens and the Bronx is growing very rapidly where our transit investment do not exist there. They are all Manhattan-centric. So you could say, okay, this is a whole new system that I could use automated, you know, driverless vehicles of minivans or whatever, which are very inexpensive to, inexpensive to run and to create a, a, a mass transit in a sense, a low cost mass transit between those areas which don't have a, a subway. So that, that's, a, that's a whole, you know, new, uh, new field that we could open and maybe it's, it's better I, I don't know that from a technology standpoint because that's maybe a, an environment where it's easier to run an automated car than in the heart of Manhattan, right? So that, that may be that too. And then we could have, we discussed that earlier, uh, you know, some of the, the, the cars should be uh, SUVs and some should be very small cars depending where it is in the city, right? How do you use it? So uh, we're back to the multimodal system where you have a lot of different modes uh, applic applicable to a lot of different contexts. Just like in software, you, you'd use the different software and tools to do different things, and you don't use one thing to do everything. So it's, it's no different from that. And I think, I think the uh, uh, automated car is, uh, is another layer on that. 
uh, which may be complementary and in, may become very appropriate in some situation. We don't know that yet, but we may discover that for some situation it's very, very, very appropriate and, and really the way to go. And then some other situation, people are going to say, well, it doesn't make a difference, so I don't care, right? So we don't know that yet. There's, there's one thing I wanted to uh, mention that you, you didn't talk about, that a lot of, once you have driverless cars, uh, a lot of, it's not just big cars that now don't have a driver. You can have, if you're delivering a pizza, which is half the traffic in the in the Manhattan, you don't need. Uh, you, right now, there's a huge car with a with a, with, uh, and most of it is for the for the driver, uh, and uh, but you can have a tiny pod delivering the pizza, baking it as it's uh, being delivered. In fact, yeah, ex and uh, and so the, we can have a lot of reduction in traffic because uh, not all all uh, traffic has to be big cars carrying people. We can have trucks that go at night. Uh, we can have trucks that go the long way because there's nobody inside, whereas the people who are going to work get the priority. There's so many new options. It's not just about replacing the existing traffic and taking the driver out. It's a, it's a new kinds of vehicles, new shapes of vehicles, new traffic patterns at night, better use of, uh, of uh, resources, things that we done we can't even consider now because we don't have those technologies. So, so it's really a, it's much more than what we're talking. The options will be much greater than what we have now. Just, just to speak quickly about transportation equity, which you were talking about up front. I mean, the whole system outside of places like New York, which are obviously outliers, you know, most of the US, the entire system is designed on the premise that you own your car and can drive it. Um, but people, many people can't. People who are obviously, who are blind or who are too old to drive or can't afford a car um, are, are pretty strongly left out of the system in most of the country. And so if there's a chance that autonomous vehicles can bring options to people who just are totally left out of the system in a lot of places in the country, that, that also is a huge amount of people who could benefit tremendously. Yeah, I mean, so one thing we were talking about b before is, as Christine mentions, you know, there's good drivers and bad drivers, even though we're all humans. When, when it becomes half human, half automated, uh, you can start to think of potentially nightmare scenarios. Uh, how does, does, does DOT look at that kind of situation at, at any point in time and, and see when it needs to be a tipping point? Does it, treat, does it treat that situation differently from an all automated world? Yeah, so the policy itself, it does address, it, it mainly focuses on levels three through five, but the one thing we are right now um, gathering further feedback on is the requirement under section one, which is the vehicle performance section, and there's a, a, well, it's not a requirement, they're voluntary. It's called the safety assessment. And these would be letters that um, the OEMs and others would submit to us where they show that they've considered um, 15, 15 areas and how they are, I wouldn't say, I mean, it's not, it's not complying, because again, this isn't about compliance, but kind of offering everyone, not the feds, but also the public reassurance that they've looked at these, these areas that are of concern. So as I mentioned earlier, incidents will occur, they have occurred, and, and we are ready to use our full authorities to investigate and take action when necessary. So, but we do recognize that there, there is gonna be incidents. So, so we have to wrap up in about a minute, but, but with the, the last little bit of time, I, I would like to go around and ask, as you're thinking about this from the city's perspective, what are, let's say, the, the, the top two or three challenges, potential implications that, that are at the top of your mind if you're in a city and you are a planner and you care about the future of the transportation network? What are the things you have your eye on? What are the, the two or three biggest issues that, that you're watching right now? You can't just say safety. You can't just all say safety. I mean. I'll take a shot first. Yeah. I think, you know, the idea, I'm biased, obviously, but I think, you know, to me, what you want to do is push for what we talked about out front, right? Get the cars to be shared. Frankly, get all cars to be shared. Um, I think if you can push the bias toward sharing and everything you do, and whether that's, you know, we don't have urban carpool lanes, but could we have them, right? If we're going to get an explosion of vehicles, how do we reward the ones that are moving more people more effectively? Um, so I think of things that, that just lay the incentives of what you want to happen in the future, whether that's you know, environmentally more efficient, whether it's more space efficient, whether it's more equitable, but I think there are things you can do today on the transport system we have um, and the options that are available today that kind of lay the groundwork for that. So I think if you start to move away from the idea that everyone owns their own car, 
um, and we were entirely reliant on owned private transportation and start to bias different policies in different ways for sharing, whether that's taking away parking to replace it with city bike and then being yelled at at a community board meeting or you know different strategies that exist to kind of push the shared model more would be my broad thinking, but that means a lot of things in a lot of different contexts. So we are, in our neighborhood, our, our top priority is the, prior, the pedestrian safety. And, and uh, you know, when I, the little I read about the uh, automated cars, uh, it looks like there is a need to have a lot of infrastructure built in the road in order to make it work. He says no, she says yeah, whatever. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm making an assumption for once. I got some, some infrastructure. Uh, and... You know, I see the I see the reluctance of the DOT to implement aggressive um, change in the infrastructure to satisfy safety. I'm concerned about that, and I'm concerned that you know the change in infrastructure will be a, a, a break, will put a break, and will put a dampen into the adoption of those cars, or maybe because there are those cars, they will be more open to change the infrastructure with the benefit for the pedestrian. But right now, for the pedestrian, I don't see, between the pedestrian and the cars, I don't see the pedestrian winning the, the war there as far as changing infrastructure. And I'm afraid that it, would, it may be the, the same situation for the uh, electric cars. Uh, I'm sorry, for the um, automated vehicle. So I think the most... Uh, the, the urgent things are, I think we have to look b beyond safety. There's just an incredible economic opportunity, a ripple effect. When we look at uh, driverless cars beyond just transporting people, but goods and, uh, and, uh, and uh, traffic patterns and emergency vehicles, and, and there's a cascade of things that, the good things that can happen. So I think it's, it's uh, imperative that a, a place like Manhattan, which is sort of ideal because at first it's choked with traffic, so it has a lot to gain. Also, traffic here is relatively slow, so we're not driving at 80 miles an hour and have all these you know, fast decisions. These are all difficult decisions, but everybody's driving slow, so it's a good place to start. So I think it's sort of an ideal place to do experiments, and I would urge the city to uh, be proactive and not just wait until LA does it in San Francisco. We should do it first. Yeah, so I know Eric said we couldn't say safety, but I, I have to say safety, say sorry. Safety. Um, but for us, another priority, as I talked about a little bit earlier, is you know just the impediments that do possibly exist for this technology to advance. I mean, we see the great potential. It offers so much promise for safety uh, that that we do want to uh, get rid of those, if possible, those impediments, or, or for them to you know be changed. I last week myself, I got to uh, test drive. I won't mention the name of of the vehicle. But it did have that technology on it where it, it could detect the pedestrian. They wouldn't let us test it out. <laughs> they only, they said, you know, not with the feds in the car, but um, <laughs> just in case. Uh, but it did, I did get to test out some of the other things, which are, are the lower levels. So it, it does offer all of it, offers great potential. It's, it, it's exciting. It can be scary I mean, when you talk to several folks. Yeah, they get worried. Um, but again, we, we know where, where our place is. And for us, this is the policy document. It's the right tool at the right time. And people say, you know, you need to regulate. You need to regulate. But what are we regulating? We don't, we don't have that data right now. And regulations are built on sound data. So. Christine's going to sneak in one more very quick comment, and then we have to wrap up. So fast. You raised the issue of safety, and, and I was thinking that indeed it would be really helpful if uh, no seal of autom automated vehicle was given unless there is a, des a pedestrian detection, and because the rest of it is automated. But you know, the concept of detecting the pedestrian is really f fundamental in my mind. So we have our first comment to the DOT tonight, so that, thank you for that, Christine. Uh, please submit we, that to the docket. <laughs> can we please thank the panel very much? Uh, I really appreciate you guys. Um, so let me quickly remind you, for, for the second brainstorm here, we, we, have, uh, we have breakout sessions. We have uh, about 20 minutes uh, once you get to your groups to quickly introduce yourselves and start chatting about uh, 
uh, some of the issues we've raised tonight uh, up here at this panel, of course, some of the issues you've been thinking about yourselves, and some of the issues that you'll be guided to by the team leaders in the sidewalk uh, t-shirts who will be monitoring and staffing those, those uh, breakout groups. So if you can pull out the cards that I mentioned with the letters on them. Uh, if you're in A, B, C, or D, you're heading up the stairs. Uh, you can follow, the, the, again, the folks in the sidewalk shirts with the big signs. If you are after, if you're E through K, you're over here and you're following uh, those big letters. Thank you, folks. to allow innovation to run its course. And then the, the one thing that I took away from the talk uh, earlier that I, that I wanted to kind of re-emphasize was that cities don't have to wait for autonomous vehicles to have the tough conversations about things like sharing, things like curb management, things like vision zero and pedestrian safety. Those conversations can, ha can happen now and they should be happening now. Uh, autonomous vehicles might offer a political window to, to move that needle, but uh, that's not a, a reason to sit back and, and wait for that uh, to happen, to have these tough and important conversations. I also wanted to remind everyone that uh, we are working with Transportation for America uh, on our collaborative of 16 cities across the country, and as they begin to, to generate results and exchange ideas, uh, we will let you know about uh, those results and give you, give you feedback about what those cities are, are learning both from themselves and from each other. And let me refresh the survey here once more. It looks like we have, uh, we're, we're getting toward 100 responses. How critical is the city's role in planning for a driverless world? Overwhelmingly, everybody chose the most critical. That's got 50, over 50% 50 at this, at this point. Uh, it goes down from there to, to slightly less critical at 25 percent, so uh, everybody in the room seems to, seems to believe the cities really do have a role right now in, in planning for and preparing for a driverless world. From an urbanist perspective, what are the three most important issues or challenges facing cities? Transit equity is number one right now with 55 percent. Pedestrian safety has 48 uh, percent. And urban development, whether it's going to end up being a more uh, suburban world or urban world, or I guess both of the above, is, is the, the third choice at the moment. From a technologist perspective, the three big issues were, number one, data security with over 70% uh, of the feedback, and then pedestrian safety and, and usage, whether or not this is a shared vehicle or a privately owned vehicle. Um, so thank you. Continue to fill out those surveys because we're going to post all the full results tomorrow in our weekly newsletter and let you know. Um, let, me, let me go to the big finish here. We, we see these events as experiments in themselves. We're Sidewalk Labs. We, we do uh, have experiments and, and try to develop our own ideas and hypotheses, and, and these events are part of that. So we would really appreciate you will get a link tomorrow to, to give feedback and commentary on this event. We really appreciate if you would take a few minutes just to fill out that feedback call it even for the beer. Uh, it would help us a lot to learn what we're doing uh, and, and what we're doing right, hopefully something. You are all invited to our next event, December 13th. Uh, it's going to be uh, anchored around the question of what can technology do to ease the housing affordability crisis? Um, and it's going to be uh, what we're calling an idea tour. We've arranged for six uh, presenters from across the country who have new ideas about ways to use data, ways to use design, ways to use uh, a combination of economics and finance to change the way we think about making housing and, and um, buying or owning or sharing housing, um, and all toward the goal of reducing uh, costs of housing in cities. Um, so you will all be invited December 13th. I want to thank uh, Alyssa Chisholm, 
Megan Wald, Anthony Townsend, uh, and everybody else at Sidewalk Labs who, who helped uh, lead a breakout session. Without you guys, we couldn't have done this event, and certainly not without our wonderful producer, Susan Kish. Uh, thank you very much. And I want to thank all of you for attending. You, you really, your time is valuable. You took a leap of faith. We actually didn't really tell you anything at all about this event until like last week. And I wish I could say that was intentional. It was mostly because we didn't know anything. Um, but but I, I really appreciate it. And, uh, and it shows that you are as invested in the future of cities as, as we believe we are. And we hope to see more of you in the future as we build this community. So thank you very much for coming. And now, uh, please, finish off the beer.